Well, the session is going to be moderated by Mr. Rahul Mishra, Head of Marketing and Comms, Shemaru. Please, can I have a huge round of applause and him on stage, please. And now I am going to be calling up our panel members. We have our first panel member, Ashish Pratap Singh, Head of Digital Marketing, Exigo. Varun Kumar, CMO and Head of Growth, Zoom Car. Jairaj Jadav, Vice President, Head Marketing and Digital Business, Tata AIG. All right, I'll move on with the next name. We have Bhargavi S, Head E-Commerce Ecosystem, ICICI Bank. Please, a huge round of applause. Next, Radha Prasad, Vice President, Performance Marketing, Ventus Avenues. Alright, Rahul sir, over to you. Hello. It's working. So we'll, uh, so Jairaj is on his way. Uh, when he comes, he comes and joins us right in the middle of a very interesting discussion we're going to have over the next uh, 40 minutes today. Uh, firstly, I think uh, thank you to the audience uh, for being patient post lunch and uh, being part of this uh, en enriching discussion we're going to have today. Uh, thank you to my fellow panel members. Uh, I think we've got a we've got a great mix. Uh, uh, you know, in the panel here today, uh, uh, you know, some experts in the digital marketing space, uh, people who've been running performance uh, marketing to the T, uh, as we say, companies which are sort of built on performance marketing, uh, you know, plus we've got representation from the agency side as well, uh, from Ventus as well, so they've been helping brands uh, achieve their uh, performance marketing metrics as well. Uh, ICICI Bank, uh, then we've got a representation from uh, Zoomcar, again, a very strong digital uh, focused car rental company uh, doing a lot of work on digital, and of course, Ixigo, which represents a huge chunk of the travel uh, advertising buy. Uh, they have a fiercely comp competitive space, and it'll be good to get a sense from uh, you know, all my fellow panel members today. And, how, how do they look at this particular challenge? So the topic today is pretty interesting. Uh, I just made some quick notes uh, last night and I'm gonna, I think just to give a sense to uh, the audience here and to all of us here, I think uh, just to put a context of what we mean by performance marketing because you know, it's, it's a very, very broad term. Uh, it, performance marketing has been existing before digital marketing in, even came to place. There's a KPI attached to every marketing dollar we spend as marketeers. Uh, essentially, that's what performance marketing is. But for our conversation here today, I just want to give a quick context to what we're talking about before I open up the mic to my fellow panel, uh, fellow panel members. So uh, in, the, in the traditional form of advertising, you know, advertisers would pay a huge amount of dollars, uh, you know, and so, sort of put it out, splash it out all there, and that won't be linked to any performance that'll be linked to a certain brand love, brand growth, a funnel being created, which is gonna eventually lead to uh, revenue for the company. And that could actually mean that you're spending a lot of money in the short term or a medium term without having any conversions as well. With performance marketing, advertisers can actually only pay for a conversion. A uh, conversion for an advertiser could mean actual sale, for a lot of e-commerce companies or online-based companies, sale happening online itself. It could also, great, so we've got Jairaj as well. Welcome. Good. Great, welcome Jairaj. So I'm just setting the context of uh, what the discussion is gonna be today on performance marketing. So, right time. Uh, so, so yeah, performance uh, marketing advertisers only pay for successful conversion, which could be a CPS, a cost per lead, a cost per acquisition, 
whatever the matrix it is. So you actually only pay for that part of the part of the advertising you're spending on. And thanks to data-driven, uh, you know, approaches by most firms right now, this is getting more and more used across companies. Uh, a lot in India, a lot of a huge bank of customers available online. How do we convert them? How do we make them buy our products is what focus of most brands is. And it's become 100% measurable right now. The entire industry has actually been able to bring in a lot of uh, technology in place. There are various networks, there are various ad fraud companies who, and auditors who help brands get their uh, right metrics in place. Uh, also what happens is a lot of uh, marketing right now doesn't have to wait for the big budget approval coming from the management to go live with a product. You know, you've got a product right now, it's a digital product, I can actually run a performance marketing campaign immediately. Because I know if I invest X, I'm going to get 2X of that. So I don't need to wait for my board to approve a huge marketing spend for me to go do it. Uh, so we can actually see a lot of movement happening very quickly thanks to performance marketing. Uh, it's a good space, it's got a lot of merits. Uh, I think the idea today is to discuss and learn from the experts as well as to what their thoughts are. So I'm going to, uh, the first question I'm going to actually open up uh, to the panel is going to be, are brands becoming more focused on performance marketing with the hope that will anyway bring them brand love? So essentially what I want to understand is that the brands you are representing, are you focused a lot more on performance marketing? Are you putting a lot of money behind performance because you're reaching out to a huge set of audience with the hope that the audiences you're reaching out to also love your brand, not just, con not just look at a transactional basis, brand conversion. So I'll actually open up the discussion. Let's start with uh, Varun. We'd like to hear your thoughts on sure, that. Thanks, thanks, Rahul. Uh, hi, hi, everyone. Uh, that's a great question. So like, let me take a step back, right? Uh, uh, imagine like quickly for next uh, like probably 30 seconds imagine like let's go in past like 10 years from now uh, in, the, in, the, in the history I mean uh, Facebook was still struggling for traffic Amazon was still selling books and by the way iPhone was just two year old so point is that cut to you know 2019 I mean marketing has changed so much in last five years than in past 50 and, and this is because the root cause of all of this is that earlier, uh, even 10 years ago, the bu businesses were actually brand-centric and everything was outbound. And hence, like, uh, uh, you know, you had to invest a lot of marketing dollars upfront and then create an uh, inbound pull. So in that process, some things were measurable, some things were not measurable. But now, the pa there is a definitely a paradigm shift because, um, you know, businesses are consumer-centric. I mean, I mean, imagine like if, if you, want to, you want to buy a product, I mean, you don't, you don't have to go to a physical store, right? So you go to all these, you know, popular shopping e-commerce sites and there are multiple micro-million moments of truth. And when there is continuous interaction of a consumer, with the platform, uh, so he's researching, he or she is researching online, then you know, buying offline, which I famously call as robo, robo effect, or reverse robo, that researching offline and then buying online. So what happens is when there are multiple micro million moments of truth, you have to catch the customer wherever he is. And hence, you have to deploy a multi-channel marketing strategy. And since the beauty is that each of the channel is so highly measurable, that there is no choice as a marketer that you have to, you know, really see as to where this customer is in, you know, the entire consumer decision journey, basically the path to purchase journey. And hence, everything becomes measurable. Hey, by the way, when was the first time the customer came to my side? When was the second, did he make a purchase? Did he made a, you know, uh, do a, you know, add to shopping cart? Like, and then did he dropped off? Why did he dropped out? Let me, you know, retarget him with a remarketing banner. So the holy grail, the genesis here is obviously to get him convert and then him repeat, then repeat. And basically, like, you can actually build a model, like, there is a famous uh, buy till you die survival analysis model that how many times this customer would actually interact with your platform before churning off. So just to, like, yeah, so probably that sets a good tone for the Yeah, it's very interesting, actually, insights. You've got, a, you've got your own sort of matrix you've developed in-house, which you use to uh, measure success of 
your campaigns and your retargeting and your programmatic. Excellent. Uh, I think the next, I think I'd like to open the question to Ashish and uh, we'd like to hear your thoughts at Ixigo. Uh, I be, you know, we were just chatting up before, the, before we met here. Uh, I think Ixigo is very focused on performance. Uh, you know, I, I just want to get a sense from you, how is your journey in performance been? Uh, are you seeing uh, your brand being more accepted because of your performance campaigns? And just to get a sense from you, what, what that means to you. So, uh, as Varun uh, highlighted that uh, advertising change in the last 10 years from, you know, a non-attributable uh, spends to now attributable spends. So, in performance, the, uh, the main keyword that is, that's uh, attribution, right? So, uh, if we attribute every money, every penny spent on uh, marketing to uh, my business metrics, that can be a simple app install or a simple website visit to a lead or to a conversion or to a repeat, whichever is the metrics for that business. So uh, that's actually, uh, you know, the uh, crux of the performance marketing, right? So, and people uh, also working, uh, you know, people also working towards, you know, measuring uh, radio advertisements or let's say TV advertisements and link it to the, uh, link it back to every penny spent on the slots and all. Uh, so that's the thing. So as an Ixigo, uh, we have, you know, built a brand Ixigo uh, on performance marketing, purely on performance marketing. And what we feel is if you, if you do the product right and if you do the marketing right and if you keep retargeting that customer, keep pushing your brand values, why you should, why the user should use your product versus other products, uh, then definitely you can, you know, kind of build a brand on, uh, performance marketing and that, that you know, push via retargeting mediums that's available and the kind of data that we are gathering and the kind of uh, power uh, in retargeting we are adding with all these uh, data points. Uh, it can be a success metrics for a business and it can be, it can drive actually organic growth also if you uh, do it right. So essentially driving business and the brand together is what you're able to achieve uh, through performance, that, right? That's good. Oh great, that's nice to hear. Uh, I think uh, Bhargavi, I would like to just get a, some initial thoughts from you uh, as to what your overall vision uh, from the company you represent is on performance and, and how do you look at it as your business which you manage right now? Okay, so um, up front I can't comment on the marketing of ICSFM because I'm not from the marketing team. However, we work extensively, I work extensively with clients who are, uh, who are built on the basis of performance marketing, right? Uh, uh, the cost of customer acquisition significantly makes or breaks their PNL. Uh, and what we have learned is that there is an extremely uh, overarching, I think across the board, it's universal. I don't think there is any company today that is talking cash burn to, uh, you know, to acquire a customer. Every single penny that a, a large entity, a large client spends to a younger, newer startup, you know, uh, they are very careful about where they're spending their money. And even before, typically as bankers, we are conservative, known to be. Uh, but the clients today start off conversations saying, this was how we were spending earlier. This was our cost of, I'm not getting into specifics on clients or how much. So if my cost of acquisition was 1000, today my cost of acquisition of that same customer, and they're talking cost of acquisition of the customer, the same customer is something like, there's a 60. So, 1,000 to now 600. So, there's a good 40% drop across clientele, I'm saying. So, I think what each of these uh, organizations are doing are pointing in exactly the same direction. And I, since I'm now in banking and I'm looking at banking, how my banking counterparts are doing. So, Citibank has publicly stated that it ran a campaign. Uh, and if you saw a few days ago, Facebook had taken out this really big attribution, voila, last page of the Economic Times, yeah. telling us what we should be doing. Um, but I'm not going to talk about India, I'm going to talk about Thailand, uh, where they spoke about, uh, they're saying that they got 75% increase in conversions with a 74%, let's take 75% reduction in cost. So you're telling me earlier you spent 100 rupees to acquire a customer, today you're spending, if you do the math, 14 to 15 rupees to acquire the same customer. I mean, that's efficiency, that's super crazy and I'm, I love it. Interesting. Wow, that's, that's some good learnings here. Uh, I think let's get a sense from the agency perspective here right now. So uh, at Ventus, uh, you obviously help a lot of brands uh, do that. So do you, do you see uh, a lot of pressure from the brands you work with to get their performance metrics better and better on a, on a weekly, daily basis? 
and how do you sort of enable that for some of your brands you work with? Uh, yeah, true. So when uh, we're dealing with any brand, particular brand, so every brand have their own perspective of uh, conversion goals. Like a uh, couple of brands, like in the BFS segment, they are uh, looking out at the end level conversions. In uh, let's say in OTD segment, they look out for the views. They look out for customers who are actually viewing the ads because that, that's where they are earning money. When you're talking about the gaming client, they will be talking about how many level you are completing. So every brand is having their own perspective or own goals set uh, initially. What we do is we actually set up uh, basis on the targeting. Like we actually strategize everything on a phase by phase. So whenever there is a performance campaign launched in the market, when we strategize that the first phase should happen like a awareness. If you are not a big brand, obviously the users should know what is all you were talking about. If you are offering something, then obviously the user should know that you what exactly the offer is all about. So we create a strategy for every phase. Of course, there is a lots of challenges that we are facing from a brand saying that uh, the your deadline or your attribution window is uh, let's say seven days, thirty days. It all happens. But over a period of time, in between that frame, how exactly you are reaching out to the same users and monetizing them, and also helping them in re-engaging with your brand. That's how we are actually achieving the conversion for all perspectives. It's a high-pressure job. That's great. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, Jairaj, uh, again, one of the one of the biggest digital spenders uh, in the market. You guys have been uh, running a lot of. Uh, Branding and performance campaigns, I would say, uh, on digital. Am I right to say that? Yeah. You've done a mix of that. Uh, from from your perspective, how do you uh, how do you see this performance marketing space evolving, and and where is the right mix for you? Uh, where do you where do you see sort of here? I need to build a brand for ten years, and uh, here I want revenue today. How do you manage that sort of space? Uh, so I think uh, fundamentally uh, the way we probably look at it is uh, we don't have like especially you know we don't look at something called brand and a performance as a separate thing. It's probably uh, about building the audience, uh, engaging the audience, and probably converting them at some point of time, right? So it's a it's a funnel management for your business. Uh, whether you look at bottom of the funnel or the top of the funnel, uh, that's how we look at it. Uh, also, I think uh, uh, you know we. Uh, like you know, we uh, the whole performance management, uh, uh, performance media has been kind of evolved from perspective where uh, you know it's been becoming complicated every year by many players coming into you know kind of competition, moving into it, spending more money onto the same plus uh, kind of martech ad tech evolution that has happened. It's making Every year it becomes complicated, right? Uh, but it's like a, a probably uh, any of the you know games that you play. Every level it becomes complicated, but that's where also by you know reaching to that you are also becoming expert to get yourself up, you know kind of master the game. So it's a, it's a part of our DNA uh, as, as Start IIG, and I think uh, we look at it purely as performance everything like you know and it's building funnel for us building audience for us okay great great okay that's interesting uh, i'm going to sort of uh, change the sort of uh, space we're discussing right now uh, i think it's this is going to be a little more uh, from your each of your business perspective you can sort of give 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 me a quick one line response or a longer response if you wish uh, you know, with ad blockers becoming very rampant globally, uh, it's actually coming to India in a big way as well right now. Uh, are you seeing uh, any any threat to some of the performance campaigns you run at this point of time? And my second part of the question is, uh, because of ad blockers getting more and more rampant, influencers are becoming affiliates now. So there are influencers uh, on social media who are able to give you your performance metrics in a, in a much better way. So there is now, traditionally we only had affiliates or a programmatic running performance campaigns. Now we have a set of influencers who can actually help us achieve the same results. Uh, and for the benefit of all of us uh, and from any learnings you've had in the past, uh, could, you, could you want to share what your thoughts are on this space? I think anyone you can... Uh, I think uh, I'll give you a number on the ad blocker, blocker thing. So 
like typically it's still a single digit number like you can pro even google it but uh, like as far as my best knowledge is concerned it's uh, something like uh, close to 3 percent so uh, like ad blockers still in india is like very very in nascent stages of course globally it is uh, on a like rising spree so i mean all and also, it is also a chicken and egg situation because like obviously like google being the you know like the big daddy over there and if you like they almost own dbm they were they own youtube right so point is like uh, they it they would definitely uh, come around with counter solutions uh, where uh, you know if you if you skip a, even if you, I will give you an example of YouTube if you sk skip an ad if you don't want to view it you can actually uh, in your settings I'm not sure if many of you know this in your settings you can actually turn off videos and uh, one of the things which you know YouTube want to monetize um, say monetize is on the YouTube premium which they have recently launched so you completely get all the things ad free so that's one thing. I think the second, uh, like the sub answer to your question is that, uh, you know, a uh, lot of co-curated content is happening, which is a very, you know, like refined form of advertorials, right? So it is not the on the face, like just kharilo, kharilo, beshlo, beshlo, right? Not that kind of advertising anymore. The third, uh, I think the question, like interesting question which you asked was around uh, influences. Influences. So, bass spot on. So, like at Zoomcar, like uh, if you can, like uh, oh, you all of them, I'm sure you have your Instagram handles. You just go to Instagram and uh, just search for hashtag Zoomcar. I mean, we have more than 100k followers, and the kind of content that we get fr uh, from our, uh, you know, consumers is humongous. So all of this is user-generated con content UGC. I mean, I know brands literally pay uh, to influencers to actually post uh, UGC. And we are actually, you know, like Zoomcar being a selfie brand, being, you know, in that space, travel, leisure space. I mean, we get this a lot of love from our customers. I think uh, the answer and the kind of trend that we have seen is that we have seen a rise of micro-influencers. So it's okay. So because there are two so, things so to Varun, have you have you ever given the same performance metric you would give to an affiliate to a micro influencer absolutely. for conversion? And what is your uh, yes, response to that? Absolutely. Has it worked the same absolutely, way? Absolutely, absolutely. Because like like with due respect to Mr. Amitabh Bachchan, but if Amitabh Bachchan will tweet something, it looks like an advertisement. But did you pay Amitabh Bachchan? Yeah, no, no, no. Not not at okay. Zoom car. Okay. But if if genuinely a micro influencer who's who's actually used a service because if you're searching for a flight ticket on Xigo or if you're actually searching for a Zoom car, you might actually, you know, go on a trip advisor and might trust someone who has given, who has a four or five star rating and you, you actually trust those people than probably a celeb who's saying something on Instagram, right? So typically what we also, like we, like uh, our cost per acquisition is like something like uh, 200 rupees cost per booking. So we get like almost one and a half lakh bookings per month on this LY space. And like 10% uh, of it is actually driven by influencers. And these are like most of the organic uh, channels. Right That's now. great. That's sort of almost from zero is now 10% in the last one or two years, I'm imagining. And anybody, uh, Jairaj, have you had any opportunity or Ashish? Uh, so on the ad blockers front, Varun was right. So we are not, you know, uh, in the phase of worrying for the ad blockers. Uh, but on the mark influencers front, right? So influencers at Exigo, we, you know, take uh, really seriously the influencer and especially the uh, micro influencers, right? So uh, we designed a nice program, this social mojo, which actually, you know, uh, takes care, uh, looks at your social cloud and gives you certain points and then you can book, you know, your travel uh, with those points. Uh, and we actually attribute uh, it same as our performance channels and it's, you know, if you talk about performance and cost per conversion, it's at par with our best performing performance channels. So, you know, and with all these uh, new social uh, apps like TikTok and uh, ShareChat and all these micro-influencers, getting more and more power and more and more, uh, you know, reach to extend to a brand to drive performance or to, you know, to uh, drive a brand campaign through that. Oh, excellent. Okay. Uh, okay. Sure. Yes. So, uh, so like, like Varun and Ashish told, obviously, the ad blocker is completely, it's not a uh, trade right now in India. So, like Varun actually told the right figure, it's actually 3%, it's 2.79 percentage, which is uh, triggered in the last uh, quarter of 2018. Uh, if you're looking at the figure, that 2.39 is only for uh, mobile. Desktop is quite high. Desktop, you will be seeing almost 40 percent ad blocking happens. But why exactly these ad blockers uh, have been placed in picture? So, the reason being, most of our millennials actually looking at uh, the creative placement. So, how engaging your creative are, based on that, they decide. 
So we'll be going our recent studies by Google only. So they have told like 60% uh, of the users, which are into 16 to 34 age group, they actually prefer to see a content more on the traditional media than on digital media because of the content that are playing on the digital space. And they're ready to go for the ad filtration instead of ad blocker. So ad filtration is a concept wherein you can actually personalize your own ad uh, interest areas and you're conceptualizing that I want to showcase this kind of ads to my users. So personally, you can actually block what kind of ad you want to see or what kind of ad you don't want to see. Yeah. So that kind of feature is already available. And coming back to the influencer, it's always there in the market. So previously it was called as, uh, let's say, incentivizing reference check, referral uh, cross check. So now you're calling it, uh, so because of the social media part, you're calling it influencer marketing. Obviously, influencer is altogether a different game. So the, whatever the conversion they're doing, they're doing into their own frame of uh, like audience or own frame of followers. But in the affiliate market, when you're putting a benchmark to achieve something, obviously we are looking at a gross level like how mass, how targeting can be niche, that kind of feature we are already looking at. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, in your roles as marketeers and heading businesses, you know, uh, have you ever in, in the last maybe recent times I would say have you been have you ever been under the threat of a network an ad network because you're dependent so much on performance right now for your metrics uh, you could run your own performance channel but you have to work with various networks and they help you enable uh, businesses uh, like in our case uh, from Shimaru's point of view we're on an OTT platform as well and uh, there are times we've had conversations with networks where we've been uh, asked to shell out 100% of the acquisition money of the sale transaction is what the network is is looking out, which probably doesn't make business sense. Why would I get into a performance then? But yeah, it gives me numbers. Uh, not as much to ventures, but I'm generally saying that there are, there are industry norms right now, and all of you in your in respective sectors have facing the same. Do you at any point feel uh, threatened by networks, uh, or do you feel networks are enabling you build your performance uh, metrics? Anybody I think that's, you're actually taking out all the secrets, right? So point is that, like, without naming the networks, see, one has to understand, th the audience pool is common, whether it is being hatched by network A, network B, network C, or network D. I think you're actually hitting uh, in the right direction. You need to spend some significant amount, tight, uh, amount of time into affiliate uh, marketing to understand what is quality traffic, what's not quality traffic, what is bot traffic. Because like typically how network work is like there will be a big network. Under big network there will be sub-publishers and then sub-publishers and then sub-publishers and then actually the one who's running your campaign. So all the network will come to your doorstep saying, oh, you know, by the way, tell us what you want and we'll give you, but give us exclusive, uh, you know, contract and, you know, we'll get you this inventory. I think with networks, the holy grail is to maintain discipline. If you master the art of discipline, I think you've cracked affiliate networks. So in, instead of going impressions, burn and cost per click, I, that was so 2016. You have to be really, and pardon my language, you have to be really anal about the performance metric because uh, you have to, you know, like the way, uh, you know, you work for, with other channels, you have to work on say cost per first booking or cost per like second transaction or repeat transaction. I know there will be a lot of hiccups from the network saying, oh, you know, when you, Google, with Google and Facebook, you still work on cost per click and then you find an arbitrage. They will give you all sort of arguments. But yeah, it's a bit chicken and egg that you have to master an art of discipline while dealing with them. That's a, that's a very honest response. Interesting. Any, uh, Jairaj, you want to fill in something? Here? So Sorry, probably, uh, you know, uh, we've never used network okay. in a recent time. So, so I would not uh, probably want to So how do you how do you run your performance uh, marketing I think, right as now? As I said, you know, for us, it's uh, probably audience building. And uh, we look at uh, using, uh, you know, certain set of media or, a prop, you know, uh, things like probably content marketing to build top of the funnel uh, and then you know, kind of get the audience engaged at, over the period of time, then okay. do the remarketing at the bottom of the funnel. We use Adobe, so I don't yeah, want to kind good. of talk about the product, but uh, so we use, uh, you know, sort of automation there at the uh, bidding part of it, and uh, that's how probably we've been spending huge amount, but we've never used network from that perspective. Oh, great. Uh, that's interesting, actually. Uh, great, I think we are... Uh, Almost got a lot of time. Uh, 
I would just like to, you know, get some thoughts from you. Uh, overall on the performance marketing piece uh, before we end this discussion. Uh, so from, from a, so I'm a marketeer, so how I look at performance piece uh, is a little differently actually. So I feel performance marketing is great for immediate marketing efficiency. You want to drive numbers, go ahead, do that. But it actually ignores how brand actually grow and make money over a period of time, a long-term interest. Uh, brands do not go by targeting high probability consumers. They actually go by targeting low probability consumers and converting them to consumers. Keeping that in mind, and if you, if you, you may agree or disagree with me, what are your thoughts on performance marketing, especially these companies which have been built on performance marketing? How do you see yourself in the future taking forward? So I agree on that. I mean, uh, the brands in a long term build on the, uh, from top of the funnel, right? When user starts looking for that, actually starts planning uh, for that product. So let's say if you talk about a house, maybe uh, when you start a job, then uh, I can, you know, keep aspiring you. Or when you, uh, if you talk about travel, maybe three months before the travel season, we can uh, aspire you. So that's what I said. Uh, there are two things. One is we go all out in brand marketing throughout the year. One is that way. Second is, uh, you know, uh, target uh, your customers when they are actually in the planning stage, right? So uh, specifically, if you talk about travel target users, uh, you know, uh, when two, three months before uh, the season starts, uh, do a good, nice branding campaign based on, you know, content, uh, nice content and put money on the branding and keep retargeting those users. So retargeting is the key, right? Attribute those users and keep retargeting them with nice offers and maybe uh, good aspirational content and all. So that, that's uh, my point of view and that's how we, uh, you know, see it. Uh, we'll pass the mic to her. Sure. What are your thoughts? I think it's a staircase function, right? Uh, so the beauty of performance marketing, especially if performance marketing is digitally driven, even if you're a, a startup, I mean, you, with a very limited budget, you can start, you know, piloting, lot, doing a lot of A-B test and, you know, get initial success. Once you hit an initial success, there is no two way about, about it that you, once you reach an inflection point or probably a critical mass, what after that? Because you will hit a ceiling for sure. So in order to then expand the ecosystem for your brand, you have to invest in brand activities. And especially like mass media activities and ATL could be a good thing if it fits into your annual operating plan. So it is basically a staircase function that you, and of course you can measure ATL as well. So it is like, perf like performance in digital, then you want to grow exp exponentially, you invest in ATL and you mass media, then again performance, then digital. So it's basically a staircase function. Until unless the last thing I want to say that there is, a, there is something which you know we famously ask performance market is called as ROI, ROAS or cost to income ratio. Until unless if that number is under a good range, you will keep the board of directors happy. It's good to hear. Uh, Bhargavi, what are your thoughts on uh, so, the brand piece? Since I am the odd one out and uh, I, I, it's business that I look at, not just marketing. So to me, marketing is the incoming funnel. I think what you've said, everything, right? And to build on that, so you have your digital marketing, you hit a certain, uh, what you call, a uh, threshold. Then you try and uh, do mass market uh, overall campaigns, and then you take it forward. Combined with this, I think, goes uh, efficiencies, which uh, anybody who runs a business will talk about, wherein I need a sales conversion efficiency. My CRM has to talk to the lead gen tool, right? Which today, Many of the old fashioned tools are two separate things and you're tracking different things and I'm selling on different things and the final revenue or profit of an organization is made on what is tracked within the CRM. Uh, so that is one. So for example, in BFSI, right, uh, we found that uh, somebody says I want to go loan or I want an educational, I want a personal loan, right, I want to go on somewhere and book a travel holiday and he's interested and it's coming to me via a partner, right. Uh, or somebody saying I'm traveling so I want travel insurance. If you don't call the chap within 10 minutes like I was telling you earlier, that lead is gone. So the intent was there, the, it was genuine customer, high quality partner, but you've managed to ruin it. So I think combined with each of these, uh, the true success of marketing is in getting other people to realize the value that they are giving and having the support of those functions, which is what I think within the organizations especially, uh, that's something that you'll have to be, I'm sure you are working along with, right? With your sales teams, especially in your direct sales teams. Yeah, so, so your direct sales teams, you're basically direct to customers, so you would have to do this to get any benefit from your top line. So, 
Yeah, sorry. Yeah, sure. uh, is she right? mentioned i think uh, uh, as much of uh, you know time and energy that you you kind of invest on to acquisition i think it is also important to kind of streamline customer journeys uh, to get the right roi metrics uh, correct i think that's the way to look at it also just to probably add uh, i know uh, we're running out of time but uh, uh, on the same line you know uh, for us uh, you know what we have realized is uh, while you know as much as investment that you're able to do at the bottom of the funnel is fine but you know at some point of time you'll reach uh, you know kind of threshold there uh, the way we have over the period kind of you know build the whole thing is uh, typically for a travel insurance uh, if you look at uh, hardly a 1% of to total population who travel by travel insurance so there is always a scope to kind of uh, increase the bucket out there right and how we've kind of uh, done our journey in last couple of years is we've started our engagement with the audience around three, four, year, three, four months before he actually buy insurance, right? So in a travel insurance journey, it's typically uh, the guy decide to, you know, kind of travel destination around three, four months back, probably in January, and end up traveling in April, May, June. Uh, earlier, we used to do only performance marketing only in these three months. Now, what we've done is we've expanded our bucket into content marketing display, social engagement, and started mapping user journey even before he decided to buy. Very interesting. Uh, Jairaj, what are your sort of thoughts on, uh, on the brand piece? and the performance? Uh, so, so when we call about the performance marketing, we normally, when we do it at networks or agencies, uh, our end goal majorly coming across like new user acquisitions. But when we do the similar kind of strategy with Facebook and Google, we actually create a strategy for a couple of months. So obviously, every uh, brand having their own uh, like convergent flow, it's a complex journey of the convergent flow. It depends on how, uh, like how your flow is lengthy or something. Like if uh, your convergent flow, like he said, for uh, travel and insurance, the convergent flow ends at three or four months back. So probably in a shorter flow, you might have been depending on the uh, like ad networks or agencies, but in the longer journey, you are actually depending on the Facebook and Google. So when we are uh, working with any ad networks or agency, we actually forget to talk about the lifetime value that this particular ad network is bringing on. We are actually not looking at the post attribution metrics that post attribution metrics that has been followed by these ad networks. That is one reason we are not able to exactly attribute whether this uh, particular ad network or agency has contributed to my end conversion or not. So that is something wherein most of these uh, brands have to work on or, uh, along with the agencies and networks. You have to work on the targeting, retargeting at the, at the same time on the data-driven strategies. Then only you will be able to achieve the convergence properly. I think, yeah. I think some really very interesting conversation and very, I would say, very candid uh, responses by all the fellow panels here today, panel members today. Uh, I think what we're going to all take out from this is that performance marketing is the sort of uh, way to go for uh, businesses to invest in at this point of time, uh, thanks to the growing digital marketing ecosystem. But at the same time, we need to find a balance between uh, the long-term value of a customer, which we can also look at attributes uh, beyond uh, performance to build that. Uh, I think on that note, I'd like to thank uh, my fellow panel members for joining us today. Uh, do we have time for any questions from the audience? Uh, excuse me, do we have any time for any questions from the audience? Offline? Okay, fine, so I think we will uh, uh, you know, end it now. Thank you so much for your time. It was great being here. Thank you. Thank you so